Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ron Hartman. I'm the Director of Product Management for the Me or Making Eligibility Easy platform. Today, we're pleased to have Mr. Greg Ford, CEO and co-founder of TalentClick Workforce Solutions, speak with us about the TransClick Driver Safety Quotient Assessment product that is part of the Me Driver Qualification Package that you all use. Greg and the members of his organization help employers create happier, safer, and more productive workforces by providing online risk-based employee assessments for hiring and training. Over the next 30 to 60 minutes, Greg will provide guidance on how to understand the Talent Click report and how to use it for hiring and training purposes. Before I hand over the presentation to Greg, I'd like to take a couple, take a couple of moments for some housekeeping items. First, just to let everyone know, all participants have been placed on mute. And second, during the presentation, if you have any questions, you can use the question dialog box on your control panel to send them in. And towards the end, we'll open up the lines of communication so that uh, we can then have a discussion and answer any questions. OK, so let's begin. Greg, over to you. Thank you very much, Ron. Welcome, everyone. And my name is Greg Ford. And uh, thank you so much to all of you. I understand everyone on the call today is a user of the, uh, the driver safety quotient. We just call it the DSQ. And that's wonderful. I'm here to talk a bit today about the background of the uh, DSQ, for those of you that may not be familiar. But more importantly, it's how to understand the DSQ and how to use the results. And we'll leave lots of time at the end for questions, OK? So this is the agenda for today. I'm just going to speed through the background on us and really get to what you're here for today, which is that understanding and the usage of it. Uh, one thing I want to mention is it's not just going to be talking about the use of the reports for hiring, but also the use for training. And some of you may be interested in that aspect of it. So who is TalentClick? If you're not aware, we are a global company. We happen to be based in Vancouver but we are in more than 40 countries around the world, and I spend far too much time on an airplane these days. Um, I'm from Alberta originally, but I moved out to Vancouver about 11 years ago, but uh, I also have lived in Ontario, and I know a number of people uh, have, are, that are on the call today uh, live in Ontario, so uh, I've got a soft spot in my heart for, for the Ontario region. These are some of our customers, and the big takeaway from this is that you'll see we're in quite a large number of industries. We operate in, of course, transportation, but also in construction, um, natural resources, mining, forestry, utilities, you name it. So let's get to the heart of the problem. Whether you're in transportation or whether you're in construction or uh, whatever it might be, the research shows that one out of four people is higher risk. And what does higher risk mean? It can mean different things to different people. If you're um, in a safety sensitive role, then of course it's about uh, injuries. Who is more, who has more of a propensity to acting unsafely? But we have a number of clients who operate in non-industrial sectors, and to them, higher risk might simply mean someone who's a poor producer, has a bad attitude, there's a higher risk of um, voluntary termination um, or um, involuntary, they have to fire the person. Or more seriously, it could be things like theft, fraud, uh, violence, harassment, uh, you name it. So back to transportation um, and talking about higher risk, these are some really interesting statistics. Some of you may have seen this before. Every two miles, the average driver makes 400 observations, 40 decisions, and one mistake. And once every 500 miles, one of those errors leads to a near collision. Once every 61,000 miles, one of those mistakes leads to a crash. I found that really fascinating. Now, you're having a look at a fellow on the screen right now who uh, <laughs> is the consummate multitasker. Problem is, he's doing it behind the wheel. So this is me. This isn't actually me. I don't look like that. But <laughs> um, I'm, I'm highly distractible. And I'm going to be making fun of myself a bit during this call because I score high risk on a lot of these dimensions. And I've learned to accept that about myself. And you heard me earlier talk about the safety self-awareness for training. 
I now have awareness of who I am and what I'm, you know, what my, my danger blind spots are, and that could be a real useful application from some of your existing employees. I'll talk a bit about that later. So here are some of the causal factors, and we know that not everything is tied to personality. Uh, sometimes it can be environmental or equipment, of course. Um, but when we look at the human crash causal factors, 56% involve recognition errors, uh, distraction, inattention, and 52% involve things like you know, judgment and deliberate decisions to drive on safely. Now, I want to point something out. When I talk about deliberate decisions, we here at Talent Click are not about pointing fingers of blame and catching people doing things wrong. Um, I think there's too much of that in safety. What we're all about is psychology and understanding how people are hardwired. And we always say there's no good or bad personality. After all, we're, this is how we're born. How could we blame someone for being outgoing or introverted? And that's what's important to understand when we're trying to understand people ahead of time uh, at the hiring stage. Are they a good fit for the job? They may be or they may not be. I am not a good fit to be behind the wheel of a um, uh, you know, an 18-wheeler for hours and hours. I'm just too, uh, I need variety and stimulation. I'm too distractible. Uh, I'm too rule resistant. I'm too impulsive uh, or irritable in traffic. Now, if you're going away and trying to describe... The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Sorry, I just heard a recording. I'm not sure if everyone heard that or not, but um, I, hopefully I'm still in the air. Um, so if you're going away talking to people about um, what we do and you want a really simple way of explaining it, here's what you can say to people. Everyone knows that we have an IQ for intelligence. Most people know we have an EQ for emotional intelligence, but not everyone knows that we have a uh, natural intelligence around risk. And here's a good way to look at it. What's the riskiest, most reckless thing you have ever done? When you look at these photos, you, you might think, ah, cool, that's awesome. Or you might think, oh, how could these people possibly entertain these dangers? Uh, you might look at the kid on the far right and think, um, you know, I see a hospital visit and broken bones in his future. Some of you may have uh, ridden dirt bikes in the past. Uh, I did as a kid. I loved it. I'm an adrenaline junkie. Um, I've been, been skydiving before as well. Some of you may think these are crazy activities. Others may think, yeah, that's, that's natural. We all react differently to this. And again, there's no right or wrong reaction. What do you watch on TV? What do you do in your free time? What do you gravitate to? Um, some people love curling up with a good book or just puttering in their backyard in the garden. Uh, once again, there's no real right or wrong. This is just how we're hardwired. Back to the transportation setting. What do you do when you see this? Now, this may seem like an odd question. Um, <laughs> some people think, well, of course you stop. But do you stop all the time, 100% of the time? Do you stop at midnight in your neighborhood where everything's familiar and there's no cars around for a long ways, do you come to a full stop for three seconds and look both ways? Now when I speak at a conference and I ask this question and I say put up your hand uh, if you do come to a full stop for three seconds at midnight in your neighborhood, um, a handful of people actually do put up their hands and the rest of the people in the audience look at them like you're crazy, why would you do that? You know, There's nobody around. And then I say to the people that stuck up their hands, why do you do that? And they say, well, because that's the rule. That's what you are supposed to do. And that's the difference between some people who have these default settings of being highly compliant and following the rules versus others who just don't. Um, they're hardwired differently. And again, it's about fit to the position. So this is what we're doing at the hiring stage, the pre-employment screening stage, is trying to figure people out and trying to really figure them out below the surface of the water. We can only see the tip of the iceberg and we can see past experience, skills, education on a resume. If we're interviewing them, we can see their appearance, we can hear how they communicate. Um, 
it's important to do a background check and a reference check, uh, criminal history, credit, driver's abstract. Make no mistake, those are important things to do. Uh, keep doing that. But here's what we add to the picture. It's helping you see things that typically cannot be seen on the surface. And this is personality. We call it the, the natural tendencies, the urges, the impulses, the hardwire and default settings. You keep hearing me use those terms. Here's another way to think of it. Personality is how we act when nobody is watching us. And um, it's predictable, it really is, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But back to the how we act when nobody's watching. We have clients that are, are rail companies, like CN Rail is a client, um, and they have a lot of loan workers, as do many of our other clients. And there's nobody to watch them. There's no supervisor uh, overlooking their activities and behaviors all the time. So it's critical that they do hire people who will adhere to the rules and be compliant and be focused and be you know, courteous on the road when nobody's watching them. Um, now, telematics, of course, have introduced an element of monitoring that remotely, but still it's not a perfect science and not everyone has it, okay? So I would suspect most people on the call today are uh, nodding their heads thinking, yeah, yeah, that applies to us with those kind of lone workers behind the wheel. So when we are looking at that predictive aspect, we recognize that the talent on quick that um, moving violations and past crashes are indeed the best predictors of future collisions. We know that. And, and yes, as I said before, background checks and reference checks are indeed important and necessary. But the difference is those things focus on the past, and that's like driving by only looking in the rear view mirror. So let's get into things. And uh, this is where we get into talking about more of the DSQ, and this is why you're really here today. But I want to make something clear. We're not saying we're the, you know, the magic solution, the silver bullet, the cure-all to everyone's woes and problems. Um, companies still need to be focusing on getting the safe and proper vehicles and equipment in place, the, the right training and procedures and so on. But we're adding that missing piece to the puzzle that really hasn't been uh, looked at much until the last five to ten years, and that's that personality aspect. Now, one of the things I should mention when we talk about internal factors like personality, there could be other internal factors. It could be uh, fatigue, and we know that fatigue science is a big um, study these days, and, and that's great. We know the folks in different areas of fatigue science, and what they're doing is quite admirable. Um, it could be that someone just had a baby at home, and that's what the fatigue is, so it could be temporary. Um, it could be stress. Maybe they're going through marital difficulties or financial troubles. So those are some other internal factors I want to acknowledge. All we're talking about today is the, the personality, the default settings and hard wiring. So in case you're not aware, we have a number of different assessments, but the one we're talking about today is in the left-hand column in red is the driver safety quotient. Uh, but we do have other assessments that the good folks at ISB and AFI MAC have access to, which are things that measure cognitive abilities, um, English proficiency, um, leadership abilities if you're assessing for supervisors and managers and so on. So this should look familiar. This is the DESQ. And um, we've gone through many iterations over the years. Um, we've been doing this for about four to five years. In the beginning, there was a whole lot of research that went into it and uh, validation of the methodology and so on. And I'll touch on the, the research and case studies in just a second. But um, this is really a, a, an airtight, um, scientifically proven uh, tool that you see in front of you right now. So we're going to go through each of these dimensions, and that will really help you get a better understanding of the, the data in the reports. And then also moving on to part two, which is what do you do with the data? We're all about. Um, uh, practicality and where the rubber meets the road. Having the data is nice, but if you don't know what to do with it, it's not very useful. Um, I did want to touch on another tool that we've just rolled out, and Ron and Mike and the good folks at the ISB and AFI Mac are uh, looking at this one as well. You may have some interest in this. I'm not going to talk about it much just beyond the next uh, 20 seconds, but it, it can be used to predict values. Um, such as, you know, integrity, honesty, um, responsibility, coachability, uh, positive attitude, and so on and so forth. Um, and here's the uh, workstone performance pro profile that I mentioned earlier. 
So let's get back to the DSQ and let's go through the various dimensions. So the first one is rule resistant versus compliant. And how many of you out there right now think you know someone that is highly uh, rule resistant? They just don't think the rules apply to them. Um, sometimes they're even contemptuous of authority. And um, these are dangerous people, not necessarily because they're <laughs> going to attack someone, but they're dangerous uh, behind the, the wheel of, car, of a car, especially if it's a, you know, a very large vehicle. And you heard me say I'm going to make fun of myself. I'm rule resistant. I'm dangerous behind the wheel of a car unless I'm not monitoring myself constantly. I, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll be thinking, well, there's no one around, you know, I'm just going to, you know, take this, cut this corner or, you know, not really comply with the laws on something. And then I have to remind myself, Greg, you can't do that. The laws in place for a reason, um, you have to be compliant with that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but you heard that other people, of course, uh, take comfort in the rules and guidelines. And this could be someone that is content sitting behind the wheel of a, um, doing long haul trucking for hours and hours on end. It could be someone on a factory line or even a loading bay uh, or in a warehouse uh, that just, you know, goes in every day and is very happy um, and takes comfort in those rules and guidelines. It's all about figuring out who's who. The next one is anxious versus calm. So these may not be people that you can recognize on the surface. It may be someone that you can recognize. They just seem like the you know, people that are always vibrating and quite nervous, but it may not be. Um, it could be someone who's like the duck, that on the surface of the water, the duck is quite calm, but underneath there's a whole lot of paddling. And that's me as well. So people are always very surprised when I say that. Um, because I do have a, a quite a calm exterior and demeanor. Um, but underneath, I am constantly worrying about things, and um, I have this strong sense of urgency that I'm always worrying about deadlines and needing to get things done. Now, make no mistake, um, having that anxiety is not necessarily a bad thing all the time. There are situations when we need people to react very quickly if we see a hazard on the road, if we see a hazard in the workplace, they can't just have this sort of lackadaisical, yeah, whatever, manana attitude, uh, that won't work. So it's all about the situation. Um, there's one famous situation that they just made into a movie, and that's Captain Sully, who landed the plane on the Hudson River. They say that there actually was no training for um, <laughs> having birds hit both engines and having both engines go out and then landing a plane on a river. It was a completely unforeseen and unpredictable situation. Uh, nonetheless, he remained calm in that situation. He was able to think clearly and uh, guide the plane out on, onto the river. Um, there's some debate about whether or not that was the right thing to do, but nonetheless, he saved a bunch of lives as opposed to um, you know, some fairly terrifying uh, alternative um, outcomes. So impatient versus patient. Impatient people are just how they sound. They're uh, irritable, they can easily get annoyed uh, and angry with others. So here's an example on the road. So once again, I'm a relatively impatient person, um, but people are surprised to hear that because again, I don't lash out or yell at people. I just have this kind of internal uh, agitation. But if somebody cuts me off in traffic, I'm very quick to have this internal mechanism kick in where I think, what the hell, how dare they, and I'll want to pull up beside them and glare at them. Um, now, I, I don't always do that, but that's what I feel like doing. And sometimes that can escalate. Um, we show videos of road rage where it does escalate into very serious situations, and I'm sure you all know about these, and um, hopefully things have not happened in your company as a result of road rage. But there's that strong possibility. So we want people that are generally quite patient. Um, if somebody cuts them off in traffic, they just think, you know what, they didn't do it to me. They just did it. It could have been anyone here in this vehicle at this point in time. Um, or, you know what, um, I've made mistakes on the road in the past. Maybe they didn't see me and this is just a mistake and everything's fine. I'll let them go on about their day. Or maybe they're late for an urgent appointment. And um, gosh, I, it's a good 
thing that I've let them in, then they can just go ahead of me. So that's kind of that internal dialogue that a more patient person will have. And they'll just, as I said, take a breath and let that other vehicle go on about their day. Okay? Distractibility. We showed some stats on how many crashes are due to distracted driving. It's, it's horrible. And again, it's not just text messaging. It could be that person who's eating or drinking and something spills in their lap, or they could be changing the radio station or music. Um, they could be you know, gawking around at a, something they see on the side of the road. And again, this is me. I should not be driving for a living. <laughs> so um, I, I like lots of variety and stimulation, and I tend to lose focus quite quickly. I want to mention something right here. Some of you uh, who are managers um, probably did the DSQ assessment yourselves, and you may have seen scores on there that you, at first glance, didn't like. You may have looked at this and reacted the same way we once had a VP of safety react, um, and this fellow said, well, your test is bogus. And we said, well, why do you think that? And he said, well, I'm a VP of safety, and this test is showing that I'm not very safe. And so we had to say to him, um, you know, did you ever work on the front line? And he said, yes. He was very proud of the fact that he worked his way up. And we said, well, how did you feel about that? Did you enjoy it? And he said, well, I did for a number of years, but then I kind of got bored. I needed more to do more, you know, challenge, more stimulation. Um, and he kind of got it at that moment. He said, oh, okay, it is all about fit. I'm not necessarily a good fit for that front line. Um, routine role. I do need um, to be in a managerial role where I have lots of things on the go. I can multitask and spin different plates like crazy. And that may be some of you on the line right now that are thinking, yep, that's me. So again, it's about fit. No bad personality. If you had high, so-called high-risk scores, that could mean that you're quite suitable for the role that you're in right now. Um, other examples would be um, compliant. So maybe you're in a role as a manager where you have to challenge the status quo and think outside the box, as opposed to always just following you know the same old, same old, uh, and therefore the company doesn't really advance and grow and, and try new things which become best practices. Another example might be impatience and irritability. Um, if you're too calm as a manager, sometimes things don't get done and we, we miss deadlines. So I think you get the point that I'm making, um, and this is one of the reasons I'm okay uh, making fun of myself, <laughs> is that um, I'm, I'm very much okay knowing who I am. I have that self-awareness now, just like I hope you're gaining that self-awareness too. Impulsive versus cautious. Now I want to make something clear right now. Uh, this is different than the next one that I'm going to show, which is thrill-seeking. Um, impulsive is about making snap decisions. Whereas thrill-seeking is more about seeking adrenaline. So impulsive is about taking the unnecessary risks, not thinking things through, whereas cautious people do tend to evaluate the options and analyze all the risk. The thrill-seeking people, as I said, are the ones that um, are drawn to the uncertainty, or they're comfortable with uncertainty. I mentioned that uh, I've been skydiving. I've also been bungee jumping. I've been swimming with sharks. I've done all kinds of things. But I want to emphasize something. I'm not actually a very impulsive person. I don't make snap decisions. I will analyze the heck out of something um, before making a decision and really think it through. So an example of that would be the bungee jumping or the, the rock climbing that I've done or the, the parachuting. I will do, do internet research on the companies. I'll, when I get there, I'll look at the equipment. I'll kind of uh, suss out the instructors and really be comfortable with um, the entire situation and think it through. And once I am, then I'm all in. I'm all about the adrenaline at that point. Does that make sense? Great. You heard me earlier talk about some of the research that we've done over the years. Um, we're doing a number of different studies. And in fact, we're doing another um, a driver research study right now. Uh, the folks at ISB probably made some of you aware of this, but um, we, we're still welcoming more companies into this research study, and we can give you details of that um, 
uh, outside of this phone call, but it's really fascinating. Uh, we love doing research, and here's an example of a 2014 study that we did. Drivers with highly destructible scores had a 40% higher at-fault accident rate in the past. So we did get data from them uh, about their past uh, accident rates and crashes and, and moving violations and so on. And there was a direct correlation with their um, at-fault accident rates with scoring highly distractible. And uh, same thing with highly resistant scores. Um, those people had a 130% higher at-fault accident rate and a four and a half times higher number of traffic tickets. That was quite astounding. Um, irritability, which you heard me say leads to road rage, 158% higher at-fault accident rate, 38% higher near-miss rate, and the near-miss rate came from telematics, uh, measuring heartbreaking incidents. So this is the new research study. We've, we've just started. I think we now have, uh, the slide's a bit old, we now have more than 100 commercial drivers. We're focusing only on commercial drivers. And the preliminary findings are what you see in front of you right now. So uh, there's definitely a correlation with the, the scores on the DSQ um, and the uh, WVA assessment as well. So things like aggression, irritability, distractibility, and rule resistance uh, are definitely proving out to have higher uh, incident rates in all these areas. Uh, there's also one I haven't really talked about sorry about that, is the, um, um, the job performance ratings. So what we did, or what we're doing in this research study is getting uh, job performance ratings from the company, and it can be as simple as a one, two, three rating. So a three is a top performer, two is average or good, and one is a low performer, and, um, and then we're just correlating the results. So the people that uh, the participants, the drivers who had high aggressive scores, as well as a few other scores, um, definitely were scoring a bit lower on uh, the job performance ratings. Uh, and that's by the supervisors that didn't even know about their, uh, their scores on the DSQ. Okay? So lots to talk about with this, which we don't have time to today, but uh, it's quite interesting. Um, this is a bit mind-boggling, but I just, you know, we're not going to go through this, but just know that there's some very sound science. If there are any people in the, on the call right now from HR and you've ever studied um, social science and psychometrics, um, just, this just gives you reassurance that there's very sound validity and reliability. Um, and we can pass this along to anyone in the organization if you need it. So one thing we've gotten more into is the group analytics. And um, this is fascinating as well. And this is, we've just rolled this out. In fact, there's an announcement going out. Um, I think it was uh, today, if I'm not mistaken, or, or a few days ago, about team analytics. And the team analytics are now available to every organization. So that can be available through the good folks um, in the Me platform through ISB and AFI Mac. But what this does is every one of these dots, they're actually diamonds that you see on the scatterplot graph, are individual people's results. And what we do is we plot groups of people onto the graph. And now we can identify patterns and trends. And I'm just showing you a hypothetical example here. But you can see a whole bunch of people are clustering uh, on that first row at the far left side under resistant. And we can then correlate the data with the crashes, and it shows that there's more people who are um, you know, having crashes that are rule resistant. Same thing with crashes due to road rage and, and impulsive driving. But more to the point, here's what I want to get to with what we're doing and using the assessment results. We can benchmark the best drivers, the top performers. So we can see patterns and trends of where your top performers are clustering. And we can start to benchmark um, who those best performers are and create ideal score ranges on the actual reports that you use so that you can then look at a new person, a new applicant, and say to yourself, hey, this person's falling within the ideal score benchmark ranges on, on all of these or you know, half of them. And that's pretty darn good. We definitely want to talk to this person, maybe bring them in, um, you know, do spend the money on you know, the, the full background check and what have you. So um, this is a really useful tool. Here's another example um, under the distractible versus focus section, okay? 
So again, lots to talk about with this, a little more than we have time to today, but benchmarking ideal um, hires is a very, very powerful tool that I guarantee will lower your employee turnover rate and help you hire more top performers. And those top performers typically have fewer crashes, fewer moving violations, and so on, okay? We are all about the results. As I said, where the rubber meets the road, we know you have to you know, save money. You have to have fewer crashes. You have to have more you know, on-time deliveries and, and higher customer satisfaction rates and win new business and on and on it goes. So how to use the report for hiring. Now before we get into this, I'm just going to check quickly to see if there are any questions. I don't see any questions, so I will continue. But if you do have one, feel free to type it into the, um, the box on the side under questions. Um, nope, still not. Okay. So how to use the reports for hiring. Um, one thing we strongly recommend is do a bit of preliminary work on who your ideal applicant is. You heard me talk about doing the benchmarking. Um, there are questions that you need to ask internally, and you'll see some sample questions on the far right side. And these could be for any kind of position. It could be, um, let's say, for accounting. Um, does this person need to be highly analytical and highly detail-oriented? Well, of course, for accounting. So what you want to do with one of our other assessments is make sure that they score very high on that range, which would be attention to detail. Now, when it comes to transportation and the DSQ, you might want to have questions on there such as, does the position require um, strong compliance? Well, yeah, I would think you know, nine out of ten of your positions would. But then you can map um, you know, where you need the people, the applicants to fall uh, with that particular dimension. But here are some other non-obvious ones. So if you look at the, um, the third one down, is there a lot of interaction with others? Or the fourth one, does this person need to please customers and suppliers? Um, there are two different kinds of drivers out there. And there are some who are, let's call them lone workers, who don't really need to interact well with people. While there are other transportation companies that um, customer satisfaction is a huge deal and there's a lot of interaction with people and they do need their drivers to be pleasant and cordial and, and cheerful and, um, and that's the kind of person they're looking for. Um, they need to be pleasers and therefore you need them to score high on a couple of those other dimensions such as let's say more outgoing, a little more empathetic, as opposed to being you know, blunt and, and abrupt and so on. So that's some of the other things that we can help you with, not just on the DSQ, but on the, uh, the other assessments as well. Um, and uh, the next one down you may not have thought of as well, does this position require high attention to detail? Um, perhaps, perhaps not. You know, are there bills of lading uh, down at the bottom? Are there manuals, um, regulations they have to read? Do you need them to have a high English proficiency um, or not? Um, do you need them to be spontaneous? Do you, are there, you know, if you're, a, let's say, a, um, an in-city um, courier service, maybe you need the people that can react very quickly to um, changes all the time. Um, call them up and say, you have to go pick something up, be there in, in 11 minutes' time. And you want the person that craves that sort of excitement and thrill-seeking as opposed to the person that is thinking, oh, brother, you know, here, here we go again. Uh, that kind of person is probably a little more suited to being a long-haul trucker. Okay, so hopefully this is making sense when we talk about mapping the ideal applicant profile. Um, I guarantee this works. Um, we're, we do this with big companies um, in all kinds of different industries and all kinds of departments, as I said, accounting, uh, sales, um, technology, you name it. And it really does work um, sort of using the carpenter's creed of measure twice and cut once. So here are some of the um, sample boxes, if you will, in green. And th again, this is just a, a hypothetical example. These green boxes could be narrower, they could be wider. Um, some of these dimensions may not be relevant to you at all. Um, some of them you might want to rate as the most important. Let's say 
um, distractible, let's say compliant or you know rule resistant versus accommodating. Um, that's up to you. I don't know your business, um, but we can certainly you know engage and talk further if you really want to. But um, this is the the visual representation that you or your recruiters, your people in HR, your operations folks, when they're looking at the DSQ at a glance, they can now see who is falling into which ideal score ranges. And as I mentioned earlier, they can go, yep, this person looks great, let's move them on to the next stage. Or, hmm, I see they're falling out of range on, in this example, number two, anxious versus calm. Um, number four, distractible versus focused. And the last one, thrill seeking. Let's probe into that further. Let's ask the person more, um, behavioral interview questions. Let's ask the reference checks more questions. And the questions could be things like, um, okay, distractible and focused, they're highly outside the range. So the question could be, um, tell me about how you have learned to focus. Tell me about how you've learned to override this distractible tendency that you have. And by the way, when you ask that, people will look at you like, how do they know I'm distractible? <laughs> so it's a little magic that happens. Um, or it could be asking the reference check saying, um, I have a tool here that says this person is highly distractible. Um, was that a problem for you? Um, how did this person learn to you know, compensate for that? And um, one example might be they might say, um, and this is an example for me, Greg, um, I have learned to overcome that by putting my phone in the glove compartment or in the back seat or pulling over to the side of the road if I absolutely have to make a phone call or check messages. You might hear back uh, from the reference check or from the actual interviewee that that's the situation. Or you may hear them go, well, you know, I don't, I don't know, I just do the best I can. Or even worse, well, everyone, everyone does it. Um, that's not a good answer. <laughs> but there are people out there that have this um, sort of normalization bias that it's normal. Everyone does it. Everyone uh, breaks the rules. Everyone you know, loses their temper once in a while. And um, a tool like this can help you confront those people that um, may be trying to hide some of those tendencies. Okay, So this is a really powerful way of, of using the DSQ. Um, I'm not going to spend time on this. This is the, uh, the work values assessment. You can go through the same exercise with that. And here's the WPP, which is a little less for the frontline operators as opposed to you know, supervisors or managers um, in the corporate office. This one's a little bit more about, let's say, leadership qualities, uh, or as I said, things like uh, empathy versus um, you know, direct attitude and so on. So when we are looking at the actual DSQ results for a candidate, now what you can do, now that you know the ideal scoring profiles for these people, is you can start quantifying the results. You can rate them uh, one, two, three in these different areas. And now you can just add up the scores. If you have candidate A and B and C and D and so on, if you have the luxury of many applicants, um, you may only want to start with the people that have the the better score. So it becomes more, um, there's more rigor attached to it, more science, if you will, opposed to looking at a resume and thinking, yeah, this looks good. Um, the, the other thing to mention, I've been talking about the interview questions. Um, these interview questions are tailored to each specific person. So candidate A, if you look in the report, will have different interview questions than candidate B. This is part of the magic of what we do. We, we churn out different interview questions uh, based on the results. Now, if they're candidate A and B are both distractible, then you might see the same interview question. But typically, um, they there will be different questions um, if they have different, slightly different scores or greatly different scores. So. I'm just going to check messages again before I go on to the last piece. Questions? Nope. Okay. So we're good. So the last piece of the agenda is the uh, the training. And 
the DSQ report comes in two different reports. There's the employer version and the participant version. So let's talk about the employer version for a second. Uh, coaching tips for onboarding and for training and development. Um, in the left, on the left-hand side of this page, you'll see there's some language about positive aspects of how John Doe scored and then some safety risks or coaching tips or we call them performance considerations for this particular person. So this becomes powerful if you choose to hire this person. Now you know what to keep an eye on. Too often supervisors will hire someone and then it's, you know, good luck. Um, and then they'll do performance reviews once in a while and they'll check in and say, hey, how's it going? And the employee says, good. And that's about it. <laughs> it doesn't really become a meaningful conversation. And what we're trying to do is help you have a more meaningful conversation. So the supervisor or manager at the, at the time of the performance review, or it doesn't even have to be a formal, it could just be an informal, you know, you meet someone out in the yard and you say, hey, how are things going? Do you remember when we talked about you uh, and that DSQ report and how, you know, you're probably a little more prone to be distractible or impatient. Uh, how are you doing with that? You know, have you had any examples on the road recently? Um, and the, the uh, driver might say, yeah, actually, you know, two days ago I got cut off in traffic and I remembered what you told me to do, you know, count to 10, not take it personally and so on. Um, and now you're, as I said, having a more meaningful conversation as opposed to just that superficial, yep, yeah, everything's great. Um, in transportation, um, I'm wondering if it's the same as we see in many other organizations where companies will promote to a managerial or supervisory position the best frontline person. So in construction, time and time again, we see the, the superintendent or foreman was the best carpenter or the best electrician or the best pipe fitter or whatever it might be. And too often these people get promoted without really having much uh, management training or leadership training. They, it's interesting, they've got thousands of hours of training on their craft and they're excellent technical people, but they've had almost zero training on how to lead people. And every organization says people are the most important asset, but then they don't really know how to execute on that. Um, some of the better companies will put people through leadership training but see it as an event, a one-time event. It's a one and done, and then off they go, and the, they must be great now. Well, no, I mean, it takes practice. And this tool that you see in front of you gives people a bit of, um, you know, a foundation for that practice, for the ongoing discussion that can take place with the onboard, uh, sorry, ongoing um, coaching and, and employee training. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense to you. Now the other version of the report is the participant report. And by the way, don't give this to the, to the applicants, um, but you may want to consider giving this to people that you do hire who have become employees. And we call this safety self-awareness. You can see the little icon on the right-hand side of the screen. And you heard me earlier talk about me now having my awareness about me. I, I'm distractible, I'm impatient, I'm rule resistant, and so on. So I have learned now to have these little micro-interventions based on my own self-awareness. And I do that all the time. It's taken practice, but I now instantly flip into different uh, internal language or internal dialogue when I'm in these different situations and I'm telling myself, okay, Greg, put the phone away. Or Greg, they, you know, they, the person cut you off, but don't take it personally. And this is their one mistake today, late for an urgent appointment, and so on and so forth. There are dozens and dozens of examples like that. But this can become a good tool for those frontline employees now as well. And once again, we don't want to force this upon them as you're a bad person and we need to cure you. It's more about this is who you are. We want to hold a mirror up so you have more knowledge of your own default settings and your own hardwiring. And, you know, we're going to love you for who you are, but we, we need to empower you to make better decisions yourself. And that's why we're giving you this tool. We give you all kinds of other tools, you know. Sometimes we give people hard hats or safety vests, and here's another tool. Um, and this is pretty powerful. So you'll see on the right-hand side, feature three, there's a safe self-action plan. That allows people to actually um, 
you know, walk through the, the report themselves. At the back there's a little worksheet and it asks them to sit and think about some examples, some situations that they were in, what triggered the unsafe behavior and so on. Not everyone is going to love this. Not everyone will do it. Um, you can mandate it or you can, you know, encourage people to do it. That's entirely up to you. But for those people that actually do it, we typically see about half the people come away seeing some value out of it. Half of them will go, that was really interesting. I never knew that about myself. And they'll embrace it. Maybe another 25% will go, yeah, I guess it was okay. You know, no harm done. Um, and the final 25% will just dismiss it out of hand, thinking, you know, that's a waste of time. Um, ironically, those are the real resistant people. <laughs> so, um, but that, that's the way it is with all training, isn't it? You're never going to get 100% buy-in with any training, whether it's classroom facilitated training or e-learning or what have you. So um, if you can get a good 50% incremental gain, um, trust me, that's a very good outcome. So we're coming to the end, and I just want to kind of wrap things up with some of the takeaways that we all have different personalities. This is how we're born. And in terms of the personality uh, safety, uh, risk settings, some of them um, directly impact safety. And um, we gain self-awareness um, with the safety self-awareness with the participant report and learn where our own blind spots are, um, or we can understand who's uh, which applicants um, have these blind spots and we can use that at the hiring stage. And all in all, what we're trying to do is improve safety in the workplace and on the road. And uh, this is a new, innovative uh, new tool. It's working and we're very pleased that you are using this. Thank you so much. Um, we assure you, you will see results over time and um, stick with it. We're here for you to answer questions and engage with um, with you on any projects that you might have or helping you improve your hiring policies and programs as well. So, so um, there's my contact information if you want to reach out or reach out to Ron at ISB as well. So, so I'm just checking if there are any questions again. Hey, Greg, thank you very much. Um, I, I don't see any questions that have been uh, sent in, but what I'm going to do, and hopefully the participants will uh, be okay with it, I'm going to unmute everybody so that uh, you have the opportunity to sort of chime in if you do have a question, um, if, and feel free. Uh, try, let's try not to jump all over everyone, but uh, let's, uh, let's see if, if this will work. So unmute all. Let's mute. Okay. So is there anybody that has a question for Greg? It looks like there isn't, so um, just, just to sort of round out the, uh, the presentation again, Greg, thank you very much for having done that. I'll just uh, put everybody on mute. And um, uh, thank you very much. Some great insight. I, I did like the, uh, the, sort of the sort of the grids that you presented on the different sort of uh, charts, what would be sort of an acceptable range. And, uh, and then comparing certain type of traits against each other. So uh, a lot of our users have questions, and uh, I encourage them to you know, uh, ask me, and then I can get uh, the right individuals. Uh, Natalie has also been very kind from your organization to spend some time with our customers. So again, thank you very much, Greg. And with that, um, with no questions then, Greg, you OK on your end? OK. Thank you very much, folks. Have a great day. We do appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye.